talking about can becoming a pirate prevent global warming. Um, I thought I'd start though by just giving you a brief background about how I got to be where I am today and what I've done. So I currently work for the University of Western Sydney but originally I did my training at Macquarie University. So I did a Bachelor of Science here at Macquarie University in the Department of Biology with a major in genetics and I will be talking a little bit about some genetics today. Following on from that, I did my PhD, continuing here at Macquarie University, and I worked with flies and antibiotic resistance and looking at some genetics um, in the flies that might help protect them against the bacteria they encounter in their environments. Once I'd finished my studies, I moved overseas and I worked for the National Institutes of Health in America. And I actually worked in an army base, and it's shown here on the slide, it's called Fort Detrick. And you may have heard of it back in um, the time when the September 11 terrorist attacks were happen happening. It's the army base where the anthrax that was distributed through the post in that time was first originated. So the labs I worked in were originally biological warfare laboratories and then they turned into National Cancer Institute laboratories where I did some work on HIV infection. Once I returned to Australia I worked at the Centenary Institute which is um, attached to Sydney University and the Royal Prince Alfred Hospital here and I did some work there on hypertrophic cardiomyopathy which is an inherited heart disease where you get a very thick heart wall and it can result in sudden death commonly in young people. After that postdoctoral fellowship I then moved to a lecturing position at the University of Western Sydney um, in the School of Medicine there which was the first year of the School of Medicine running and I was then awarded a National Health and Medical Research Council Fellowship and then I was promoted to Senior Lecturer as well, which I, I'm still there now, eight years on, and um, teach within the medical program at the University of Western Sydney and do my research out there now. So what I'm going to be talking to you about today, just to give you an overview, is a, a brief introduction to some epidemiology and how we use some maths in our research. I'm then going to talk about correlation versus causation, so how can we determine what causes something or can we say something causes something else and I'll give a few examples, so I'm going to talk a little bit about lung cancer and smoking, I'm going to talk about some genetics because that's my area that I love and at the end let's kind of have a look at whether becoming a pirate will prevent global warming and some other popular myths and how we can use maths to prove or disprove those popular myths. So to start with, we're going to talk about some epidemiology. So just a very brief overview. Um, epidemiology is the study of how diseases occur in different groups of people and why they occur. Now, in terms of how do we test this, we're looking at cause and effect. And in most studies where we use statistics, which is uh, a branch of mathematics used to determine whether things do or don't associate with other things, we often have um, our causative variable, which is our independent variable, so something we're testing to say, does this one thing cause this other thing? And that other thing we refer to as our outcome variable or our dependent variable. Now, um, I'll give some examples of how we can apply this, but importantly we need to remember that the relationship isn't always that simple. So it's not always that, look, we can see one thing here, it causes that other thing there, because as the first thing increases, the second thing might increase. So it's very important to remember there are a number of other factors that might be involved when we do these studies. And those other factors, we call them confounding variables. So things that might actually contribute to both the cause and the effect that we're measuring. And if that is the case, then we can't determine what causes what. We can just talk about correlations. This might be correlated with that or this might be associated with that unless you've got a large body of evidence to demonstrate it. So I've talked about correlations so my next slide here is is showing some correlations. So there's different directions of correlations. So the first one if we just have a look at the slide here is a positive correlation and what this means is as our um, independent or effect variable increases, 
so does our outcome or our dependent variable, it also increases. Now a perfect correlation, we would describe that as being equal to one. So 100% of the increase in that first variable explains that increase in the second variable. Now in the real world, we don't see correlations as perfect of that as that, and often we'll get some scatter around that line. But still, if you drew a line through, of best fit through these dots, you'd still see a positive correlation. In the middle here, a zero, no correlation, you can see as one variable increases, you can't determine a pattern with the other variable. The dots are all scattered all over the place. So this would be no correlation. You can't see any pattern there in that scattering of dots. Then moving to a negative correlation, which is showing that as one variable increases, the other variable is decreasing. Now, that is also um, on the right hand side there, a minus one correlation, that's a perfect cor negative correlation. And again, we rarely see that out in um, studies that we do. You're more likely to see some of this scatter. So you can move through from positive correlations, no correlation to a perfect negative correlation. Now, the important thing is to know, which I've mentioned in the previous slide, a correlation doesn't necessarily tell you what the cause is. So just because you see this relationship, it doesn't mean that this variable you're measuring on the y-axis is causing the variable you're seeing changing on the x-axis. So we have to be very careful when we use this maths in our scientific studies to say that there's evidence to suggest an association but we cannot say that one thing causes the other unless we've generated more and more evidence. So what I want to do now, giving you that brief introduction, is to move on and talk to you about some examples of how we can use these types of, I call them association studies, so correlation studies in research. And the first example I want to give you is about lung cancer. So if we go and take a historical perspective, uh, the first slide I'm showing you here is actually an advertisement. It was in a 1946 from memory and it's showing a doctor smoking a cigarette and the, the quotation under it is more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. So camel was a famous brand of cigarette. And the quote that you can't see but it's in the yellow box in the advertisement actually says the doctor is a scientist, diplomat and a friendly, sympathetic human being all in one, no matter how long and hard his schedule. So it's trying to promote here that doctors advocate smoking and it's a good thing to do and the better members of society smoke these particular brands of cigarettes. Now this is obviously back in a time when they didn't knew, know the impact of smoking cigarettes. So. What I'm going to delve into is some of the, the steps that were taken to understand how we could tell that cigarette smoking was related to lung cancer. So one of the plots that would have been seen when they were generating data was showing on the y-axis here you've got mortality index as a result of lung cancer. So mortality is death. So we're looking at death rates and a smoking index which is the larger it is, the more an individual smoked. And you can see here it's a positive correlation through the, the plots showing that the more an individual smoked, the more likely they were to die of lung cancer. Now that's some strong evidence. Again, it's an association. And for a number of years, it was seen in some papers, so some scientific publications, that there was this association but for many, many years, and mainly because the doctors themselves were smokers and the big tobacco companies weren't willing, willing to accept this, they were trying to say that, no, this index is just more about the pollution in the environment and we're an industrialised world and it's just because we've got more factories and more pollution happening, that's why there's more lung cancer. It's actually got nothing to do with smoking. We then get figures like this one here, which is on my slide, smoking and lung cancer. And you can see how the consumption of cigarettes, which is shown on the red bar, dramatically increases in the early 1900s. 
And then there's a lag time of just under 20 years and you can see that the rates of lung cancer actually plot against and follow the rise in cigarette smoking. So there's that delay which makes sense that as the rate of smoking increased, 20 years later the rate of lung cancer increased at the same level. So you could overlay those two lines on top of each other and you'd see a similar pattern. So again, that's more evidence, not causative, but an association to show that the levels of smoking in society map to the levels of lung cancer in the community. So if we have a look at the numbers on this graph, the left-hand panel here is cigarette smoke per person per year, and the right-hand one is lung cancer deaths per 100,000 people per year. And from that, I just think it's an amazing pattern that you can see. So if we have a look through the timeline of what happened, so that advertisement I showed you was back in the 1940s. In the 50s, a scientist did some research and actually showed that if you take the tar from a cigarette and paint it onto the back of a mouse, so commonly in research we do animal studies, often involving mice, that if you do that, take that tar from the cigarette and put it onto the back of a mouse, it actually creates tumours in those mice. So back in the 50s it was the first evidence and that's more direct evidence because you've manipulated it, you've actually done an experiment rather than just looking at population data. So we've manipulated something, we've added a tar to a mouse and shown that they develop tumours. Now in the 1950s there was still a lot of um, rejection to these claims that smoking was related to lung cancer and the tobacco industry itself issued a document stating that they don't believe their products harm people in any way. It took another 10 years until um, the General Council, so this is in, in the US, but noted that nicotine in cigarettes is actually addictive and it was acknowledged that they were selling addictive drugs. In that same deco decade, so 1964, the Surgeon General, which is um, oversees health regulations, and back then his name was Luther Terry, he issued the first ever um, report citing that there were health risks associated with smoking. So this is now 20 years on from that advertisement showing the doctor smoking. And in the 60s, again, it was time that they decided they better put some warning labels on cigarette packets to show that smoking um, had health impacts. And then by the 1970s, all broadcast advertising for cigarettes was banned. So radio ads were no longer allowed, television ads were no longer allowed for um, cigarettes. So that could, took a good couple of decades before some quite convincing um, research on top of the association and correlation studies that we'd seen for the effect to be seen in society to start um, highlighting the damaging effects of cigarette smoking. So what I want to move into now, so that, that example is looking at uh, environmentally caused disease, so if you think of cigarettes as um, part of your environment, so the smoke that you breathe in from them is an environmental disease. I now want to move on to talk about inherited diseases. Uh, genetics is my area and I'm actually going to take a few examples of slides that I use in the School of Medicine when I teach our medical students about genetics. Just to give you a background about genetics to bring us up onto the same level, I'll just introduce you to chromosomes. So within our bodies we have cells, within our cells we have a nucleus, and inside the nucleus carries our chromosomes which have all the information we need to be who we are. So chromosomes are made of DNA and they're pictured here on this slide, all packaged up nice and tightly and in this format they're actually wound around proteins that help them package up nicely. And I always like to think of it similar to how I've done my hair today, 
it's like you wind it round and round and round and package it up and up and up and keep it nice and tight and neat so that when you pass that information from one cell to its offspring cells, it doesn't all get tangled. So this is what a chromosome looks like in that package state. If you unpackage it, you'll see the DNA. So if we have a look at the DNA that makes up the chromosome, it has what we call a sugar phosphate backbone, which is shown here in the image in purple. Now off that backbone, we have our bases hanging. So those bases, um, we refer to them as letters A, T, G and C, standing for their names adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine. So off that backbone, you have these um, bases that hang and there's actually two backbones that go in opposite directions to each other and each have these bases hanging off them and as they hang off each other there's some hydrogen bonding that attracts one base from one backbone to the other base from the other backbone and in that pairing the arrangement of them causes it to form into this alpha helical structure. So you can see it there that this DNA is arranged into an alpha helical structure. Now bases have a pairing arrangement so that an A on hanging off one backbone will always pair with a T hanging off the other backbone and a G hanging from one backbone will always pair with a C off the other backbone. And that pairing structure helps us to identify what gene sequences are coding for because we know within the codes that certain sequences of bases code for certain amino acids which form part of proteins that have the actions in the cell that make us do what we need to do think, breathe, live, run. So all those instructions are coded for in the DNA. If we have a look at now a chromosome in terms of what can you find on a chromosome Along the length of a chromosome, you'll find what we, we refer to as genes. So a gene is a section of a chromosome that codes for one polypeptide, and a polypeptide can become part of or can become a complete protein in itself. So if we have a look here, we have a set of genes along a chromosome. Now there's usually many, many more genes than what I've drawn here, it's just an example. But in the research that I'm going to talk about, what we're interested in is understanding what gene might have a mutation in one of these bases that will then result in disease. And we might call that a disease-causing gene. Now, in the media, might hear ha um, them reporting how this poor person has this genetic condition and they have this gene that's bad. It's not actually true. We all have those genes. It's just that some people have a sequence in them of these bases that has gone wrong and therefore their gene codes for a bad product or not a product at all, which can be a problem. So we all have um, the same sets of genes, but we have slight variations in the sequence of those genes. Now importantly, we carry two copies of every chromosome and then we have two sex chromosomes in which females have two X's and a male has an X and a Y. So in terms of our genes, if we're looking at the genes that are not on the sex chromosomes and we call those chromosomes autosomes, we have two copies of every gene, one inherited from our mother and the other inherited from our father. Now that's just the background I thought you might need. If we look at a disease now, there's a certain disease in children called retinoblastoma and it's the leading eye cancer in infants and young children. So back when this was originally studied, there was a pattern that they could see that there were some cases that were much more severe than other cases. Now this research was done by a guy called Nudson and he observed this pattern in the numbers in the population and what he could see was that there was a certain group of children that would have tumors in both eyes and they would often get the disease at a very young age compared to children who had a similar disease but they had it in only one eye usually and they often didn't have the disease at such a young age and what he ended up doing was plotting 
the proportion of children who had this bad form of the disease with the um, tumours in both eyes and saying if we start at birth 100% of children are unaffected they're all born with healthy eyes yet those cases that end up with tumours in both eyes the rate at which they develop them happens quite quickly and you can see it follows this very linear trajectory down the graph so the squares are those that have very poor um, disease like bad disease and cancers in both eyes as opposed to the cases where they might get a single eye and it takes a while for those to develop and it follows a different pattern. So he developed a theory in terms of why this might be the case. Using these numbers and associations he thought that the bilateral cases are likely caused by a different mechanism to the what we call unilateral cases which is the single tumour within just a single eye. So if we have a look here, what he proposed was a two hit versus one hit model. So this slide here is showing uh, an eye, a very simple eye, and each of the white squares inside that eye is a cell. So if we have a look at the cells within this eye, in a case where you're born healthy, as we grow up, we usually gather mutations in our cells in our DNA. So some bases like an A might change to a G or a C might change to a T. And this happens in all of us as we grow up. And as we get older and older, all our cells accumulate more and more mutations. And that's normal. What he proposed in these cases that were less severe, only in a single eye, that in some cases, the same cell might accumulate two mutations in a particular gene. And once you've had those two mutations in that particular gene, that's what's required to then go on and develop a tumour. And those tumour cells will start growing and developing. Now, that could affect anyone in the population. Yet, then he proposed these other cases that you're seeing many tumours and in both eyes, that it must have a different mechanism. And what he proposed was that these individuals are actually already born with a mutation in every one of their eye cells. Well, and in fact, every one of their cells in their body. But it particularly affects their eyes. And if that's the case, as we grow and we develop these mutations just generally over time, you'd be able to see that every time you get another mutation in your healthy gene in any cell in the eye, it automatically then will create a tumour. So you can see that the pattern of development of tumours in individuals if they're already born with a mutation in every cell could create many more tumours and a more severe disease. And he went on to, to show that in the individuals that only have a single eye involved that it's a two-hit model, they need two mutations in their lifetime in a particular gene in order to develop a tumour. Compared to those who are born with a mutation, it's a one-hit. They only need a second mutation, so one hit of a, a gene to be knocked out in order to develop a tumour, and therefore they get many more tumours. Now from that research and that hypothesis, it actually went on to show that they identified this gene in question, which is now called the retinoblastoma gene. And they show that um, what the function that gene is, you can now go and look for other genes with similar function and found that any gene with that type of function, if you knock it out by mutating it, you're likely to develop cancer. And there are, are now a, a whole body of research showing that certain genes, and you may have heard of the BRCA genes, BRCA1 and BRCA2, which are involved in breast and ovarian cancer development, if you mutate these genes, which have a function to suppress tumours in cells, so then norm the protein these genes make help to regulate how cells divide and prevent cells from dividing out of control to become tumours. So what they found is genes that have a similar function all have an involvement in cancer if they become mutated. And different genes are involved in different types of cancers.
So that work by Knudsen was very important. That initial correlation looking at the, um, the curves of um, development of disease in two eyes or one eye led to a whole body of research now looking at cancers and looking at what we know and how we can help prevent cancers and test for people's risk of cancer. So now we've looked at lung cancer in terms of an environmental thing. We've now we've looked at inherited diseases. The last part of the talk where we're going to nut out can becoming a pirate prevent global warming and some other popular myths that we can actually apply real science and maths to to determine whether um, these myths are true. So the first one I want to talk about is the full moon. Now you've probably heard of the term lunacy or being a lunatic. That word derives from the lunar phases. So it's calling someone a a lunatic is not very politically correct these days, it's actually thought to be quite bad. But initially, um, people who were considered mentally ill um, were referred to as lunatics. And originally it was thought that these diseases were around because of the phases of the moon. So they thought that people were mentally ill because of what phase the moon was in at the time. In particular, the full moon was associated with, with um, mentally ill behaviour. So recently, as recently as last year, there was a study done on this. And what the researchers, so the surname of the, re the first researcher involved is Belleville, the question they asked was, do the lunar cycles, which is the different phases of the moon, impact on certain mental health conditions which included anxiety, mood disorder, panic and thoughts of suicide. So they wanted to um, have a look at the association between the phase of the moon and the presentation of those disorders at an emergency department and to see whether when the moon was in a particular phase you had a spike in those types of conditions. Now, when you do any of these studies, it's not enough just to plot them on the graph. You have to actually use statistics. So in statistics, what you're doing is you're looking to see whether something happens um, more than you would expect by chance alone. And the level we set that at is usually 5%. So if there's the chance that it would occur normally is less than 5%, then we would say that there's a, a significant difference between the different lunar cycles. And what they actually found in their study was, so the first one here is panic disorders mapped according to the different cycles of the moon. When you apply statistics and compare one moon cycle to the next, there's actually no difference, no significant difference. So these, that variation you'd expect to see by chance. Similarly, they looked at suicidal thoughts and mood disorders and found no difference over the phases of the moon. Interestingly, with anxiety disorders, they did find that in the last quarter of the moon, there was a slight decrease in the presentation of anxiety disorders, but that was likely due to um, being a relatively small study that they were doing and they would like to have other people repeat this study before they can conclude that that's the case. So using these numbers, in general, their conclusion was that the phase of the moon did not have an effect on the mental health of these individuals. So it was not the cause of lunacy. Another research group wanted to look at the myth of Friday the 13th. So that what they wanted to study was, does Friday the 13th, which we had one, last week, does it influence accidents? And by accidents, they wanted to measure in a hospital, is there more blood loss? Is there more presentation of patients to the emergency department? And is there more um, accidents with having intestinal perforation? So what that's talking about is cuts to the intestine on the Friday the 13th of the month. So what they actually did was, over a 10-year period, counted up all the Friday the 13th, and in that time there was 15 times that uh, the Friday fell on the 13th of the month. 
And what they showed was there was no difference between patients on those days to patients on any other day of the month. So there was, their conclusions were that Friday the 13th had no influence on the blood loss or emergency frequency of patients presenting at a hospital. So you can be rest assured that Friday the 13th is no more of a, a day to watch out for accidents than any other day of the month. Now finally, if we have a look at a correlation that's been shown a number of times throughout our favourite place, the internet, you can see if we map the rates of piracy in the world, so this is, I'm talking about pirates, so how many pirates there are out in the open seas, and there are still some of them, you actually can see that from the 1800s, the rates of piracy in general have gone down. And if you plot that graph and flip it over, you'll see that the rates of global warming in that same time have greatly increased. So somewhere out there in the literature, not scientific literature, the internet literature, they propose that if we all became pirates, we could prevent global warming. Because when there were a lot of pirates, there was not a lot of global warming. Now that there's a few pirates, there's a high increase of global warming. So back when I first showed my students back in our first cohort of medicine this, they actually each year had to become a pirate day to try and prevent global warming. Unfortunately, this is one of those graphs that I needed to show you to show that correlation does not equal causation. So what we're seeing here is a nice um, correlation between two things that are actually completely unrelated to each other. And this is where you need to be careful when you're interpreting data to make sure that there's a, a plausible link between the two things and that you've removed any confounders. So the confounder in this would be that piracy's decreased as technology's increased and the way that we move and navigate the world is quite different and the technology we have on board ships is quite powerful now. And at the same time as that technology's increased, so has our industries and our pollutions. So that has increased the rate of global warming across the world. So there's a huge confounder there in this data, but interesting to show the correlation nonetheless. So should we all become pirates? Only if you want to, but it's not going to help global warming. So in summary, what we've talked about this morning is that epidemiology can show associations. So one thing might have an effect on another, but we can't use them alone to show causation. And you need a lot of evidence to show that one thing causes another. Now some of the examples that we looked at were smoking and lung cancers, which is now known to be a strong um, causative agent for lung cancer. We then looked at inherited diseases and it showed that if you are born with certain mutations, you are most likely to develop um, this condition, retinoblastoma, as opposed to if you're not born with the mutation, we've all got a chance of developing it, but it's a rarer chance and the disease severity is likely to be a lot less. We looked at the full moon and showed that there's no correlation between the full moon and mental health behaviours. And Friday the 13th is not likely to make you have an accident any more than any other day of the week. And as I said, you don't need to become a pirate to prevent global warming. I've always also put my email address up there. If anyone's interested, they can email me with any questions that they might have. And it's just showing a picture there of our lovely building out at the University of Western Sydney and our School of Medicine that we've now graduated two cohorts of doctors out there into the workforce and we've got another um, five year groups on the way. It's okay, well thank you very much for your time and I hope you found that enjoyable. Thanks. Thank you.